don't want that. Okay, so here's what we do. If uh, you choose to use phase and amplitude modulation, so you don't, amplitude, uh, you don't modulate the frequency, you can uh, draw the, currently, the, the wave you're currently transmitting on, that, on such a diagram. On that diagram, you draw the phase as an angel from zero to uh, 360 degrees, and you draw the amplitude from as distance from the center. So you can uh, express every w carrier wave you might transmit as point somewhere in that plane. So if you build such a thing, a carrier wave generator, some box that magically phase modulates it, and some box that amplitudes mo modulates that phase modulated carrier wave, you can transmit information. You transmit information by um, marking special points in that plane and say, this could be zero, this could be one. We have more points here, so we could one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you could, mod uh, you could um, transmit three bits at a time with, uh, with this constellation. Okay, next step is um, choosing a scheme of modulation. There are simple schemes, for example, QPSK, which is quadrature phase shift keying, because only the phase is changed. If you look at the points, they're all in the same distance from the center. That means their amplitude is the same. Um, I have also uh, noted uh, bit values in there, so you see how the mapping uh, can be done. We have APSK, which is, uh, for example, used in DVB-S2, the new upcoming DVB, which will probably someone uh, bring HDTV to your home. And there is QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, which is used currently in DVB-C um, and in DVB-T with some more tricks. QPSK is used for DVBS. Just a note on the side is that um, normally you don't uh, have separate amplitude and phase modulation. You do some pretty mathematical trickery called uh, quadrature modulation to um, implement that, but that's not important for now. So if you can uh, transmit a, a couple of bits onto such a system, such a symbol, uh, the next question is how much symbols per second do you have? That me it means how many different points in that plane does your signal you're transmit does the signal you're transmitting go to every second? This is called the symbol rate because in uh, for example uh, QAM two bits are called one symbol and or how, how often you transmit those two bits, this is the symbol rate. The symbol rate uh, determines the spectrum. For example, if you look at DVB-C with 4,000 uh, 4, four, four mega symbols, sorry, with four mega symbols, you get a, a bandwidth of 4.6 megahertz. You can see that here. If you switch up the symbol rate, you get more bandwidth, but broader spectrum. Okay. That's fine for now, DVB-S and DVB-C work like that. But there's a problem, we can't use that for DVB-T, that kind of modulation. Why is that? In an urban area, you've got reflections. Your signal is reflected at houses, hills, whatever is there in your city. So what you're receiving is not an exact copy of the transmitted signal, but uh, multiple copies with multiple, time uh, multiple different time delays. That's a problem because on a typical DVBS carrier, one symbol lasts only 30 nanoseconds. That's when you use 27.5 mega symbols, which is the common bit rate on such satellites. The symbols reaching the receiver with a detour of only 10 meters, 10 meters is not much if you have a house nearby or something, already overlap, overlap and interfere with the next symbol. The symbols are, if you imagine the symbols standing in the air, they are pretty short. It's only perhaps uh, one meter, uh, 30, 30 centimeters in front of your satellite dish. The next signal, or this, the next symbol is, uh, is there. So 
there are about 6 megabit in the air between a satellite and your satellite dish. If you have storage problems, just install some mirrors up there. <laughs> okay, uh, data transmission in urban areas therefore only works with low symbol rates. For example, if you have GSM, which uses 270 kilo symbols per second, you need a detour of 1.1 kilometer to interfere with the next symbol. That's pretty much compared uh, to the size of a uh, no normal GSM cell. The problem is that DVP-T cells are much larger, and DVP-T needs much more uh, bandwidth than GSM. Another idea to imp increase bandwidth would be to use uh, more, to, to use, um, in, transmit more symbols in more bits in every symbol. We could, for example, do a quadrature modu amplitude modulation with 1,024 points in there. But that's, that isn't going to work because it gets more fragile to uh, noise and to phase noise, and it simply won't work. So we need to do a trick. We need to decrease the symbol rate and increase bandwidth without increasing uh, the fragility to amplitude and phase noise. This trick is called OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplex. This is a kind of modulation which uses a great number of narrow carriers. You remember, narrow carrier means low symbol rate. And with lots of narrow carriers with low symbol rate, we achieve a high bandwidth on small symbol rates. There's actually a trick in that. You have to um, put the, simple car the single carriers in well-defined positions so that they are orthogonal to each other, which means they don't interfere. That's why it's called orthogonal frequency division multiplex. Um, luckily, uh, there's an operation called fast Fourier transformation, which does that very efficient. So um, if we look at uh, the spectrum, it just looks like that. You can see the single carriers. You just have to imagine in that 8 megahertz wide spectrum being 2,000 or 8,000 single carriers. It's quite a lot. That's the reason why OFDM hasn't been used yet. You can't do OFDM modulation analogly or in, in analog technique because you would need 2,000 separate modulators. You can't build that. So if you have using digit, you're using digital technology, you just put the stuff into the Fourier transformation and you're set up. So DVPT is not the only thing using OFDM. We have VLAN, 2052 carriers, DAB, digital audio broadcast, should be known to Britain people, um, up to 1,536 carriers, and DVT, DVBT in its two modes, 2K mode and 8K modes use lots of carriers. So, how did we do this? Realization is where it gets really interesting. Um, to do this modulation, you need lots of computing powers. There are two ways to get such, uh, three ways to get such computing power in our days. Either you buy a really big computer, but that's uh, out of the question because it's uh, just impractical, um, or you use a DSP or you use an FPGA. We used an FPGA. For those of you who don't know what an FPGA is, there's a small introduction. Basically, the die looks like this. You have I.O. blocks, which allow the FPGA to communicate with its environment through lots of pins. Most FPGAs have uh, several hundred pins. Some of them even have more than 1,000 pins. So you've got plenty of bandwidth to communicate. In the FPGA, you have a switch matrix, which connects multiple function blocks, that are the, the big blocks, um, in a highly configurable fashion. It's actually even way more complicated than, it's the, than the picture here. There are lots of layers which do routing, routing and stuff because that's pretty important. You have configurable logic blocks, which can realize any possible logic functions on a couple of inputs, so four or five input logic functions uh, can be just stored into that block. You also have memory blocks. Each of, if each of those memory blocks holds some few kilobits of very fast direct memory. Most of the time it's uh, dual-part memory. And 
You have DSP blocks, which contain multiplicators and accumulators, which is pretty important if you want to do filtering and stuff. Okay, so how does our DVB-T transmitter modulator look like? There's an overview. You have the transport stream, which comes from the modulator or multiplexer. It goes right into the FPGA, gets channel coded and OFDM modulated. There are some, even some HF stuff in there, the IQ modulation and um, up conversion to intermediate frequency. Uh, then we go to a di digital analog uh, converter which runs at 146 megahertz. Then you have some pretty little analog stuff, some filters and some amplifier. And then we go to the HF up converter which uh, up converts the signal to the transmission frequency, 482 megahertz in this case at here to 23, 23C3, yes. Okay, there's some more filtering and then you get the antenna. We also have a um, microcontroller, some flash, a front panel, RS-232, so play, things, things to play with. The board actually looks like this. Some of you might have seen it. I've shown it around for some, times, for, for some time now. Let's have a look what's on there. First of all, we have a power supply. Power supply is pretty big because those chips uh, need pretty much power and pretty clean power, so it's not too easy to build those things, those power supplies. We have uh, some microcontroller with four megabyte of flash. RAM is built in. We have RS-232, some connector for the front end stuff. Um, then there's the FPGA with its transport stream input. This is where the data gets in. It's directly connected. We have a clock generation for the FPGI. Clocks are pretty important in transmission and DVPT, DVPT applications. So uh, there are four or five different clocks generated here with uh, hopefully high precision. And then there's the DAC. It's a 14-bit DAC running at 146 megahertz. And as you can see, after the um, DAC, there's not much. There's only this filter, which cuts the bandwidth to 8 megahertz. This is made to make uh, the people using the adjacent channels happy. And there's some amplifier. That's it. Everything done digital. So how does it look? In, oh, I marked this. Okay. So this is how it looks like. This is not complete yet. You need an up converter to um, push the signal up to the frequency you want to transmit on. You just put it on there, and, and that's it. There's a front panel for the board, which, makes, which has some menu on it. You can set all the transmission parameters and everything. So... It needs, but Linux needs to be somewhere in there. We, because you want to do funky stuff with it. The FPGA, and, uh, you, you can't, uh, if, if you aren't too much into FPGAs, you can't do anything with that. You can't just use the software and turn it on and that's it. So we want to give people to play something, something to play with. That would be um, the Linux bot. For that reason, we use the Centipad embedded Linux module. It features a 8091RM9300 um, MCU. Perhaps you know that. 46, 64 megahertz, megabytes of RAM, some flash, SD card slot, USB host and device. Device is pretty uh, interesting in that case. E Ethernet is even more interesting. We have some sound, RS-232, RS-485, some buses and stuff. Important here, uh, this is also the reason why we choose this, we have the external data and address bus, which we uh, connect to the FP FPGA. Another feature, it's pretty simple to use because it's breadboard compatible and you just uh, need to attach five walls. So we built another board. This is pretty simple. You have a small FPGA sitting in there. You, can, uh, you have a transport stream input and output and you can fit the Centipad module on there. It looks like this with the Centipad module fitted. And it boots Linux, and you can insert an SD card, and you have USB connectors, SPI transport stream connectors, some more connectors, 
and you can do funny stuff with it. With it. You can insert the, and play with the PSI tables. That's where you would insert your, uh, 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 the new firmware for 